بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم It's more information than I need, yeah, actually. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I don't really need to know. My name is Abdul Hamid Evans, and I'm 65, and I've been, I became Muslim in 1978, so it's 30-odd years. Both my parents are British, my mum's English, uh, my father's Welsh, and I was born in New York. They were both psychologists, and they both passed away now. Um, and they were both psychologists, and they moved to New York uh, just before I was born. So I initially grew up there and then came back to the UK because they wanted me to have a British education. You know, they were both psychologists. I wasn't really, didn't really have a religious upbringing. Um, when I was around 10 or 11 and I was at boarding school, I, I, I became quite kind of fervent about being a Christian. I, you know, we'd sing hymns in the choir and we had church service every day at boarding school and I kind of got into the idea of Jesus. And, and God. And I guess that sort of lasted until puberty, really, when other interests took over. And, uh, and I think I really lo basically lost interest in, in religion after that point. And really through to the time I left school, um, you know, maybe, you know, I might go to church maybe once a year, you go at Christmas, you know, midnight mass and, you know after you've had a drink or two and then you go to church. But, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say that I really was religious as a young man. Well, I, I left school in 1967, didn't want to go to university, I wanted to travel. Um, and I really got into the kind of hippie lifestyle um, around that time. And I, after traveling around a bit, I ended up in uh, the southwest of Ireland, living in um, cottage up in the mountains without running water and electricity. And, uh, and there were quite a few people who were living like that. And, uh, and I met my first wife and we had a couple of children and were just living away up there. But there was a whole move among the people there of wanting to form community. So we would have these discussions about what about if you sell your place, we could put our money together and we could you know, build and really build a community. So these discussions were, how do you build a community? What do you base it on? And at the same time, you know, in, in that kind of post-psychedelic time, there was, it wasn't all sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There was also a whole spiritual opening that happened for a lot of people at that time. Um, and certainly a kind of understanding of the oneness of existence was something that, that, that was part of the sort of general understanding at that time. It was part of our experience. So, in a way, I was kind of on an inner quest, but also on an outer quest as well, without in any way feeling that I was looking for religion. I felt that in some way the religions were over. This was a new age. This was the age of Aquarius, you know. Religion was over. Um, and then, as it happened, on, on a trip, I made a trip back to England from Ireland and bumped into an old friend of mine who basically was interested in Islam and he, he introduced me to um, people who were from the community in Norwich. And they kind of fascinated me because a lot of them had a similar kind of background, you know, they were similar kind of age, sort of post-hippie. Um, and they had, one, they had a, a kind of being that I admired. I admired their character and their behavior and how they were. But they also had answers for the inner quest, as well as answers for how do you structure community. And for me, that was, it, it was, it was so attractive um, and really surprising. I was really surprised that this was Islam. But I was also really attracted by the idea of um, that there was a community and that also they had a map for the kind of inner journey which I recognized I was on. And so as I met them, I came and visited Norwich and stayed for about a week. And, you know, after four or five days, I suddenly realized, you know, that, that I believe all of this is true. So that doesn't leave me with a lot of choice. You then either submit or you cover it up. 
and that in the end that that was no choice at all so I, I after being here around a week and you know, I, I said the Shahada um, accepted Islam and then uh, went back to Ireland where I still had a family and two children and a whole lot of friends so that was uh, going back there was a whole adventure yeah I had a lot of concerns I mean I, I suppose the primary one I had was with myself you know I mean I could really feel my my self rebelling against the idea that I was going to pray and fast for the rest of my life. You know, the, 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 the self, you know, suddenly feels trapped by these things. So there was uh, a whole internal issue going on there. But I was also really concerned about what my wife was going to say um, and also the people that I knew in the community. You know, I was, I was this cool guy in this cool community and, you know, we weren't particularly religious. You know, we were you know, hippies living up in the mountains and doing all of that back to nature thing. Um, and so I realized that I was going to have a lot of explaining to do um, because I didn't ask anybody and speak to anybody. My wife wasn't there. She was back in Ireland. You know, we didn't have telephones back then. So, you know, I, I, I just went ahead with it. But I had a pretty good idea that it was going to be a kind of a bumpy road in terms of explaining what had happened. And uh, yeah, it did turn out to be kind of a bumpy road, actually, that, that the early part after first accepting Islam was, uh, it was, things got a bit rocky at home um, until, actually until there, there was a certain point where after my third child was born, um, I actually left. I, I thought, I can't do this anymore. It, 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 I, 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 it became unbearable for me because I needed the company of Muslims. I was just living up a mountain in Ireland. I had no company. So I was doing the prayer and, you know, Ramadan came around. I tried to fast Ramadan on my own. and It was hard. I mean, I'd kept it up. I, it, it wasn't that I doubted Islam. On the contrary, I doubted the way that I was living and saw this was no longer compatible with things that were suddenly had now become critically important for me in my life. And uh, so I, I, I left. I said, you, you know, the house, the kids, the thing, you know, I can't do this. And uh, fortunately, after a few weeks, my wife showed up with all the children. <laughs> and uh, after maybe a year and a half of being, you know, steadfastly opposed to Islam or anything to do with it, you know, after a couple of days here, she met some of the women and just you did a 180 degree turn and accepted Islam. And, stayed with it until she passed away. And uh, children were all brought up as Muslim. And uh, so that, that had a bumpy beginning, but a very happy end in that sense. Transformation began even before I said the Shahada, because I was keeping company with people who, who, who were converts, some of them recently converted. And so I was kind of already starting to get soaked in, in this energy of, of, of self-transformation, which was a subject I was interested in, in any case. Um, and when I said the Shahada, when I made the Shahada, I, it was such an overwhelming sense of relief that, that, that was quite unexpected. I mean, I, was, oh, I must have wept for, you know, I, you know it felt like an hour. You know, I mean, there was such a kind of incredible sense of relief. Um, but the changes that took place in me were, were, were quite profound. I mean, the, the, the first one that you really notice is to do with cleanliness and hygiene. Because you, you know, you start to wash in the toilet, you're doing wudu, and, and being aware of those things, you know, the, the cleansing before prayer. And... Uh, and realizing, oh my gosh, this takes care of you know, a whole load of hygiene issues. And also in terms of, um, I think, my own personal habits, I found that Ramadan changed my attitude towards food uh, quite, quite dramatically. Uh, that, that a lot of the times when I thought that I was hungry, I was maybe just wanting to eat. I wasn't hungry, so eating became a sort of habit, something you do when you're not sure what else to do, or eating out of anxiety and things like that. Whereas um, remembering God and keeping company with people who, who, who remember God and remind you of God and, 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 and praying, um, these things 
take care of a lot of that anxiety. You know, if you, if you pray when the time for prayer comes, when you finish that prayer, you have a tremendous sense that you were in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. And that takes away a lot of the kind of just inherent existential anxiety that every human being feels because we didn't decide to be here. Here we are. And just finding a way to kind of really make peace with yourself and, and, and have a sense of your own destiny and, and, and hand over a lot of those big troubles that you might have, finding some way to feel you can hand those over to God, that, that, that that's the best way to go and to rely on God. And, and, and that, that, it was a refinement of the way that I'd approached life. I'd already made decisions that I didn't want a mortgage and 2.4 children and live that sort of ordinary straight life. I'd already decided in my early 20s that I didn't want that. I was already on a more adventurous path, but um, I've, I was really just tapping my way through as like a blind man with a stick. Um, and suddenly I felt like I had a map. So it changed, it changed the way that I was in terms of my marriage. I, I was much more um, confident about being the head of the family um, and being able to make decisions and being confident about that. And, uh, also, I'm <laughs> not letting my wife bully into make decisions I didn't want to make that, you know. Um, and also, I think, changed how I was with my friends. You know, you, you, you find out who people are by how they react to you when you've had a life-changing thing like this. And some people were interested in, in, in the changes that I was going through, and other people were like, whoa, that's weird. You know, I didn't think you were kind of a religious kind of guy. Um, and so you find out who's who. And, uh, you know, it also it, it made me, I really, I changed the way I lived very, quite dramatically because I was living up in the mountains, you know, without running water and electricity. And, and then after a while I realized, well, I'm going to move and live with the Muslim community. And, uh, and once I had the whole kind of family on board for that, you know, we moved to Norwich. And, and this is kind of on and off has been our home base, even though we've lived in a lot of different places, this has become our kind of home community. And, uh, you know, I've got children and grandchildren living nearby now. So that, that, in a way, I changed one community for another. But quite a few of the people from that early group, there were four or five families who also came around that time, also accepted Islam and came as part of that journey. And uh, so some of my oldest friends also are in Norwich, <laughs> no, no, which is nice. Don't believe what's in the media. Don't believe what you read in the newspapers and see on TV. When you, when you meet Muslims, you'll find that your, connect, your heart has a connection with their heart. And you have to trust your heart. And you will probably be thinking about all the complications that might arise if you become Muslim and what this person is going to think. Maybe your parents or your friends or your colleagues or your boss. You have to go beyond that because this is about you and your life and your relationship with God. This is about your relationship with your Lord and with reality. And be bold, take the leap and you'll find that you will fly.